section eleven of elizabethan demonology by thomas alfred spaulding this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by eva davis if it be granted then that it is possible to follow thus the growth of shakespeare's thought through the medium of his successive works there is only one small point to be glanced at before attempting to trace this growth in the matter of supernaturalism the natural history of the evolution of opinion upon matters which for want of a more embracing and satisfactory word we must be content to call religious follows a uniform course in the minds of all men except those duller than the fat weed that roots itself at ease on lethe's wharf who never get beyond the primary stage this course is separable into three periods the first is that in which a man accepts unhesitatingly the doctrines which he has received from his spiritual teachers customary not intellectual belief this sits lightly on him entails no troublesome doubts and questionings possesses or appears to possess formulae to meet all possible emergencies and consequently brings with it a happiness that is genuine though superficial but this customary belief rarely satisfies for long contact with the world brings to light other and opposed theories introspection and independent investigation of the bases of the hereditary faith are commenced many doctrines that have been hitherto accepted as eternally and indisputably true are found to rest upon but slight foundation apart from their title to respect on account of age doubts follow as to the claim to acceptance of the whole system that has been so easily and unhesitatingly swallowed and the period of scepticism or no belief with its attendant misery commences for although dagon has been but little honoured in the time of his strength in his downfall he is much regretted then comes that long weary groping after some firm reliable basis of belief but heaven and earth appear for the time to conspire against the seeker an intellectual flood has drowned out the old order of things not even a mountain peak appears in the wide waste of desolation as assurance of ultimate rest and in the dark overhanging firmament no arc of promise is to be seen but this is a state of mind which from its very nature cannot continue for ever no man could endure it while it lasts the struggle must be continuous but somewhere through the cloud lies the sunshine and the land of peace the final period of intellectual belief out of the chaos comes order ideas that but recently appeared confused incoherent and meaningless assume their true perspective it is found that all the strands of the old conventional faith have not been snapped in the turmoil and these re-knit and strengthened with the new and full knowledge of experience and investigation form the cable that secures that strange holy confidence of belief that can only be gained by a preliminary warfare with doubt a peace that truly passes all understanding to those who have never battled for it as to its foundation diverse to a miracle in diverse minds but still a peace if this be a true history of the course of development of every mind that is capable of independent thought upon and investigation of such high matters it follows that shakespeare's soul must have experienced a similar struggle for he was a man of like passions with ourselves indeed to so acute and sensitive a mind the struggle would be probably more prolonged and more agonizing than to many and it is these three mental conditions first of unthinking acceptance of generally received teaching second of profound and agitating scepticism and thirdly of belief founded upon reason and experience that may be naturally expected to be found impressed upon his early middle and later works it is impossible here to do more than indicate some of the evidence that this supposition is correct for to attempt to investigate the question exhaustively would involve the minute consideration of a majority of the plays the period of shakespeare's customary or conventional belief is illustrated in a midsummer night's dream 
and to a certain extent also in the comedy of errors in the former play we find him loyally accepting certain phases of the hereditary stratford belief in supernaturalism throwing them into poetical form and making them beautiful it has often before been observed and is well worthy of observation that of the three groups of characters in the play the country folk a class whose manner and appearance had most vividly reflected themselves upon the camera of shakespeare's mind are by far the most lifelike and distinct the fairies who had been the companions of his childhood and youth in countless talks in the ingle and ballads in the lanes come second in prominence and finish whilst the ostensible heroes and heroines of the piece the aristocrats of athens are colourless and uninteresting as a dumb show the real shadows of the play this is exactly the ratio of impressionability that the three classes would have for the mind of the youthful dramatist the first is a creation from life the second from traditionary belief the third from hearsay and when it has been said that the fairies are a creation from traditionary belief a full and accurate description of them has been afforded they are an embodiment of a popular superstition and nothing more they do not conceal any thought of the poet who has created them nor are they used for any deeper purpose with regard to the other persons of the drama than temporary and objectless annoyance throughout the whole play runs a healthy thoughtless honest almost riotous happiness no note of difficulty no shadow of coming doubt being perceptible the pert and nimble spirit of mirth is fully awakened the worst tricks of the intermeddling spirits are mischievous merely and of only transitory influence and the summer still doth tend upon their state brightening this fairyland with its sunshine and flowers man has absolutely no power to govern these supernatural powers and they have but unimportant influence over him they can affect his comfort but they cannot control his fate but all this is merely an adapting and elaborating of ideas which had been handed down from father to son for many generations shakespeare's puck is only the puck of a hundred ballads reproduced by the hand of a true poet no original thought upon the connection of the visible with the invisible world is imported into the creation all these facts tend to show that when shakespeare wrote a midsummer night's dream that is at the beginning of his career as a dramatic author he had not broken away from the trammels of beliefs in which he had been brought up but accepted them unhesitatingly and joyously but there is a gradual toning down of this spirit of unbroken content as time wears on putting aside the historical plays in which shakespeare was much more bound down by his subject matter than in any other species of drama we find the comedies in which his room for expression of individual feeling was practically unlimited gradually losing their unalloyed hilarity and deepening down into a sadness of thought and expression that sometimes leaves a doubt whether the play should be classed as comedies at all shakespeare has been more and more in contact with the disputes and doubts of the educated men of his time and seeds have been silently sowing themselves in his heart which are soon to bring forth a plenteous harvest in the great tragedies of which these semi-comedies such as all's well that ends well and measure for measure are but the first fruits thus when next we find shakespeare dealing with questions relating to supernaturalism the tone is quite different from that taken in his earlier work he has reached the second period of his thought upon the subject and this has cast its attendant gloom upon his writings that he was actually battling with questions current in his time is demonstrated by the way in which in three consecutive plays derived from utterly diverse sources the same question of ghost or devil is agitated as has before been pointed out but it is not merely a point of theological dogma which stamps these plays as a product of shakespeare's period of scepticism but a theory of the influence of supernatural beings upon the whole course of human life 
man is still incapable of influencing these unseen forces or bending them to his will but they are now no longer harmless or incapable of anything but temporary or trivial evil puck might lead night wanderers into mischance and laugh mischievously at the bodily harm that he had caused them but puck has now disappeared and in his stead is found a malignant spirit who seeks to laugh his fiendish laughter over the soul he has deceived into destruction questions arise thick and fast that are easier put than answered can it be that evil influences have the upper hand in this world that be a man never so honest never so pure he may nevertheless become the sport of blind chance or ruthless wickedness may a hamlet patiently struggling after truth and duty be put upon and abused by the darker powers may macbeth who would fain do right were not evil so ever present with him be juggled with and led to destruction by fiends may an undistinguishing fate sweep away at once the good with the evil hamlet with laertes desdemona with iago cordelia with edmund and above the turmoil of this reign of terror is there no word uttered of a supreme good guiding and controlling the unlucid ill no word of encouragement none of hope if this be so indeed that man is but the puppet of malignant spirits away with this life it is not worth the living for what power has man against the fiends but at this point arises a further question to demand solution what shall be hereafter if evil is supreme here shall it not be so in that undiscovered country that life to come the dreams that may come give him pause and he either shuffles on doubting hesitating and incapable of decision or he hurls himself wildly against his fate in either case his life becomes like to a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing it is strange to note too how the ebb of this wave of scepticism upon questions relating to the immaterial world is only recoil that adds force to a succeeding wave of cynicism with regard to the physical world around hamlet macbeth and othello give place to lear troilus and cressida antony and cleopatra and timon so true is it that unfaith in aught is want of faith in all that in these later plays it would seem that honour honesty and justice were virtues not possessed by man or woman or if possessed were only a curse to bring down disgrace and destruction upon the possessor contrast the women of these plays with those of the comedies immediately preceding the hamlet period in the latter plays we find the heroines by their sweet womanly guidance and gentle but firm control triumphantly bringing good out of evil in spite of adverse circumstance beatrice rosalind viola helena and isabella are all not without a tinge of knight-errantry that does not do the least violence to the conception of tender delicate womanhood the good geniuses of the little worlds in which their influence is made to be felt events must inevitably have gone tragically but for their intervention but with the advent of the second period all this changes at first the women like brutus's portia ophelia desdemona however noble or sweet in character and well-meaning in motive are incapable of grasping the guiding threads of the events around them and controlling them for good they have to give way to characters of another kind who bear the form without the nature of women commencing with lady macbeth the conception falls lower and lower through goneril and regan cressida cleopatra until in the climax of this utter despair timon there is no character that it would not be a profanity to call by the name of woman and just as womanly purity and innocence quail before unwomanly self-assertion and voluptuousness so manly loyalty and unselfishness give way before unmanly treachery and self-seeking it is true that the bad men do not finally triumph but they triumph over the good with whom they happen to come in contact in king lear 
what man shows any virtue who does not receive punishment for the same not gloucester whose loyal devotion to his king obtains for him a punishment that is only merciful in that it prevents him from further suffering the sight of his beloved master's misery not kent who faithful in his self-denying service through all manner of obloquy is left at last with a prayer that he may be allowed to follow lear to the grave and beyond these two there is little good to be found but lear is not by any means the climax the utter despair of good in man or woman rises higher in troilus and cressida and reaches its culminating point in timon a fragment only of which is shakespeare's the pen fell from the tired hand the worn and distracted brain refused to fulfil the task of depicting the depth to which the poet's estimate of mankind had fallen and we hardly know whether to rejoice or regret that the clumsy hand of an inferior writer has screened from our knowledge the full disclosure of the utter and contemptuous cynicism and want of faith with which for the time being shakespeare was infected before passing on to consider the plays of the third period as evidence of shakespeare's final thought it will be well to pause and re-read with attention a summing up of shakespeare's teaching as it has been presented to us by one of the greatest and most earnest teachers of morality of the present day every word that mr ruskin writes is so evidently from the depth of his own good heart and every doctrine that he enunciates so pure in theory and so true in practice that a difference with him upon the final teaching of shakespeare's work cannot be too cautiously expressed but the estimate of this which he has given in the third lecture of sesame and lilies is so painful if regarded as shakespeare's latest and most mature opinion that everybody even mr ruskin himself would be glad to modify its gloom with a few rays of hope if it were possible to do so what then says mr ruskin is the message to us of our own poet and searcher of hearts after fifteen hundred years of christian faith have been numbered over the graves of men are his words more cheerful than the heathens homer is his hope more near his trust more sure his reading of fate more happy ah no he differs from the heathen poet chiefly in this that he recognizes for deliverance no gods nigh at hand and that by petty chance by a momentary folly by broken message by fool's tyranny or traitor's snare the strongest and most righteous are brought to their ruin and perish without word of hope he indeed as part of his rendering of character ascribes the power and modesty of habitual devotion to the gentle and the just the death-bed of catherine is bright with visions of angels and the great soldier king standing by his few dead acknowledges the presence of the hand that can save alike by many or by few but observe that from those who with deepest spirit meditate and with deepest passion mourn there are no such words as these nor in their hearts are any such consolations instead of the perpetual sense of the helpful presence of the deity which through all heathen tradition is the source of heroic strength in battle in exile and in the valley of the shadow of death we find only in the great christian poet the consciousness of a moral law through which the gods are just and of our pleasant vices make instruments to scourge us and of the resolved arbitration of the destinies that conclude into precision of doom what we feebly and blindly began and force us when our indiscretion serves us and our deepest plots do pall to the confession that there's a divinity that shapes our ends rough hew them how we will now it is perfectly clear that this criticism was written with two or three plays all belonging to one period very conspicuously before the mind of the illustrative exceptions that are made to the general rule one is derived from a play which shakespeare wrote at a very early date and the other from a scene which he almost certainly never wrote at all the whole of the rest of the passage quoted is founded upon hamlet macbeth othello and lear that is upon the earlier productions of what we must call shakespeare's sceptical period but these plays represent an essentially transient state of thought shakespeare was to learn and to teach that those who most deeply meditate and most passionately mourn 
are not the men of noblest or most influential character that such may command our sympathy but hardly our respect or admiration still less did shakespeare finally assert although for a time he believed that a blind destiny concludes into precision what we feebly and blindly begin far otherwise and nobler was his conception of man and his mission and the unseen powers and their influences in the third and final stage of his thought had shakespeare lived longer he would doubtless have left us a series of plays filled with the bright and reassuring tenderness and confidence of this third period as long and as brilliant in execution as those of the second period but as it is we are in possession of quite enough material to enable us to form accurate conclusions upon the state of his final thought it is upon the tempest that we must in the main rely for an exposition of this for though the other plays and fragments fully exhibit the restoration of his faith in man and woman which was a necessary concurrence with his return from scepticism yet it is in the tempest that he brings himself as nearly face to face as dramatic possibilities would allow him with circumstances that admit of the indirect expression of such thought it is fortunate too for the purpose of comparing shakespeare's earliest and latest opinions that the characters of the tempest are divisible into the same groups as those of the dream the gross canaille are represented but now no longer the most accurate in colour and the most absorbing in interest of the characters of the play or unessential to the evolution of the plot they have a distinct importance in the movement of the piece and represent the unintelligent material resistance to the work of regeneration that prospero seeks to carry out and which must be controlled by him just as sebastian and antonio form the intelligent designing resistance the spirit world is there too but they like the former class have no independent plot of their own and no independent operation against mankind they only represent the invisible forces over which prospero must assert control if he would ensure success for his schemes ariel is perhaps one of the most extraordinary of all shakespeare's creations he is indeed formed upon a basis half fairy half devil because it was only through the current notions upon demonology that shakespeare could speak his ideas but he certainly is not a fairy in the sense that puck is a fairy and he is very far indeed from bearing even a slight resemblance to the familiars whom the magicians of the time professed to call from the vasty deep he is indeed but air as prospero says the embodiment of an idea the representative of those invisible forces which operate as factors in the shaping of events which ignored may prove resistant or fatal but properly controlled and guided work for good lastly there are the heroes and heroine of the play now no longer shadows but the centres of interest and admiration and assuming their due position and prominence it is probable therefore that it is not merely a student's fancy that in prospero's storm-girt spirit-haunted island can be seen shakespeare's final and matured image of the mighty world if this be so how far more bright and hopeful it is than the verdict which mr ruskin finds shakespeare to have returned man is no longer a pipe for fortune's fingers to sound what stop she please the evil elements still exist in the world and are numerous and formidable but man by nobleness of life and word by patience and self-mastery can master them bring them into subjection and make them tend to eventual good caliban the gross sensual earthly element though somewhat raised would run riot and is therefore compelled to menial service the brute force of stefano and trinculo is vanquished by mental superiority even the supermundane spirits now no longer thirsting for the destruction of body and soul are bound down to the work of carrying out the decrees of truth and justice man is no longer the plaything but the master of his fate and he seeing now the possible triumph of good over evil and his duty to do his best in aid of this triumph 
has no more fear of the dreams the something after death our little life is still rounded by a sleep but the thought which terrifies hamlet has no power to affright prospero the hereafter is still a mystery it is true he has tried to see into it and has found it impenetrable but revelation has come like an angel with peace upon its wings in another and an unexpected way duty lies here in and around him in this world here he can right wrong succor the weak abase the proud do something to make the world better than he found it and in the performance of this he finds a holier calm than the vain strivings after the unknowable could ever afford let him work while it is day for the night cometh when no man can work it is not a piece of pure sentimentality that sees in prospero a type of shakespeare in his final stage of thought it is the type altogether as it should be and it is pleasing to think of him in the full maturity of his manhood wrapping his seer's cloak about him and while waiting calmly the unfolding of the mystery which he has sought in vain to solve watching with noble benevolence the gradual working out of truth order and justice it is pleasing to think of him as speaking to the world the great christian doctrine so universally overlooked by christians that the only remedy for sin demanded by eternal justice is nothing but heart sorrow and a clear life ensuing a speech which though uttered by ariel is spoken by prospero who himself beautifully iterates part of the doctrine when he says the rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance they being penitent the sole drift of my purpose doth extend not a frown further it is pleasant to dwell upon his sympathy with ferdinand and miranda for the love of man and woman is pure and holy in this regenerate world no more of troilus and cressida upon his patient waiting for the evolution of his schemes upon his faith in their ultimate success and above all upon the majestic and unaffected reverence that appears indirectly in every line reverence to adapt the words of the great teacher whose opinion about shakespeare has been perhaps too rashly questioned for what is pure and bright in youth for what is true and tried in age for all that is gracious among the living great among the dead and marvellous in the powers that cannot die end of section 11 end of elizabethan demonology by thomas alfred spalding